I think if women everywhere were empowered to feel safe everywhere they went, it, we'd be living in a much different world. But I feel like by continuing to stoke the flames and say, oh, as a woman, you, you have to be careful and so scary. And as a black woman, it's even scarier. And it's, no, it's not. <laughs> Hi, I'm Erin Ashley Simon. I'm a broadcaster, entrepreneur, and a cultural disruptor who's redefining what it means to be a creator. Welcome to Real Gems. This episode is about taking flight, making sacrifices, and taking chances amid our journey towards fulfilling our dreams. Today's guest is a global citizen, master storyteller, and a travel expert who is the first black woman to have traveled to every single country in the world. Please welcome Jessica Nabongo. Jessica, it's great to have you. Thank you so much for having me. So you are truly a multi-hyphenate. You do <laughs> so many different things. You travel to so many different places and you are the first black woman to do so to hit every country. Yes. Uh, can you please walk us through and connect the dots? Like what, what inspired <laughs> you to do this? Um, so I've been traveling internationally since I was four. Mm -hmm. uh, my family is from Uganda. Uh, I'm born and raised in Detroit. And my parents love to travel. And so sometimes they took us, sometimes they didn't. Um, but really, like, growing up, every year we went somewhere, whether it was a road trip in the U.S. or home to visit family in Uganda or, like, Jamaica, Mexico. We always vacationed yeah. you know uh and so by the time i graduated high school i think i'd been to like eight or nine countries and um and so I, I i moved to new york did undergrad in new york and then moved back to detroit and in 2008 i decided i wanted to live abroad so i moved to japan and everything kicked off from there and, and then I visited every country in the world. <laughs> what was that experience going to different countries? Did you like, how did you map it out to know where you wanted to go at what time? You know, what was the reasoning behind like which countries you wanted to go to at a certain point? Yeah. So the thing is, um, like, I'm a geography nerd. And by the time I decided, like, all right, I'm going to finish visiting every country in the world by the time I'm 35. When I made that decision, I'd been to 60 countries. And wow. the first 60 was just like places I wanted to see in the world. Um, or like when I lived in Europe, I went to grad school in London and I lived in Italy. So I was like doing a bunch of European countries. Um, so I had all these different stints in my life where I lived in different countries and then just traveled around different continents. So when I had to like do the mapping out to get from 60 to 195, that was more driven by, okay, which countries are close that I haven't been to? Um, and then I just did it like that. So I would travel for like six to eight weeks at a time and just try and finish whatever countries I could that were close together. The great thing about traveling is that you learn about so many different people, so many different cultures, and it helps you with kind of like dispelling misconceptions that others may have, or maybe you have as a person, you know, what was one country that really surprised you the most? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, maybe Uzbekistan. Oh, okay. like I, you know, I will say like, I studied international development, so I sort of have a broad understanding of the world and I used to work for the UN as well. Um, and I, I would say Uzbekistan because I really had no idea what it was going to be like. Like, I'm like, okay, Central Asia, Silk Road, I know all of that. But it was it was great. It was, like, really amazing. It was super beautiful. Um, the mosques and the architecture is just really beautiful. And beyond that, the people were just so lovely. And nobody spoke English, but it was still <laughs> so great. Um, and it really helps you to understand, like, you don't necessarily need, like, the same language to communicate with people. Um, but, yeah, I just have really fond memories of Uzbekistan. And I knew it would be beautiful, but I didn't realize, like, I would feel so connected there. It's interesting you brought that country up because uh, I've been watching YouTube videos where they make like a specific bread where they get into the kiln and they like go so down I, and do that. I did that. Wait, you went <laughs> I, into the kiln? I didn't did do all of that. Oh. Like I stuck my <laughs> hand in there a little bit. Um, but yeah, we got wow. to when we were in the market, we were in um, Tashkent. I hope that's the capital of Uzbekistan. But we were in the market and um, and yeah, we, we went and made bread because bread yeah. is like such an important part of their culture. So we got to do that. And again, 
no one spoke English. It was the craziest thing, but we had a great time. Oh, I bet. Like, every time I watch those videos, I'm like, wow, they're just so strong and acrobatic as they're, like, going in to pick up the bread. Because they literally have to put themselves in it in order to spread it across the kiln. Also, yeah. it's very impressive. It's really interesting because they make bread similarly in Yemen mm. and in um, in Georgia, oh. which is very interesting. So is it it's just, like, a common way of, I guess, they make it? Yeah, I don't. It's really interesting because obviously like Yemen and Georgia are really far away from each other and also Uzbekistan as well. Yeah. But um, that's what's interesting, I think, about being able to travel to every country in the world and like seeing these similarities. But they all have like this round s cement situation and then yeah. they like put their whole body inside of it. So I'm like, you're not hot. OK, cool. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. When I saw that, I was like, "Ooh, the fire is like right there yeah. doing that." And but like you mentioned that it shows how there's there's so many different similarities amongst people, no matter what country you're from, no matter what language you speak. And did that? I mean, I'm sure that realization, like especially when social media has allowed us to kind of see a lot more. But do you feel like that realization of like, oh, we're much more similar than we are different? Did that realization ever hit you when you were traveling? Was this something that was already uh, instilled in you as a kid? Honestly, like, that's one of the biggest lessons that I always talk about from visiting every country in the world. Like, you know, when you just talk to people and you just relate to people, like I said, in Uzbekistan, we didn't have language, but you're just communicating with another person. And I think that's, yeah, it's one of the two biggest lessons. We're more similar than we are different. If you strip away religion, language, nationality, you take all of that out and you're just left with people, people who feel joy, pain, sadness, happiness. Um, you know, people who all want the same thing. Like we all want love. We all want children to have a better life than the parents had. You know, we all want those same things. So for me, like I really felt more connected to humanity and still feel that like on the other side of mm -hmm. visiting every country. And were you traveling by yourself or were you traveling with other people or kind of a combination of both? It was a mix. So I did 89 countries solo. So just under half I did alone. Yeah. Wow. You know, I feel like people fear traveling by themselves. And mm -hmm. was that something that you were always comfortable with? Was that something you had to kind of like overcome just traveling by yourself, especially as a woman? Um, The first time I traveled by myself was, well, the first time was in 2007, I went to visit, I was going on a little European adventure and I was meeting my friend in Paris. Mm -hmm. And so I traveled by myself to Paris and it was like horrible. Oh no. The, the Parisians <laughs> are not the nicest people in the world. Oh. <laughs> and after I survived that, I was like, I can do anything. Um, but my first, but my friend met me after I was able to get into mm -hmm. the city in one piece. Um, but the first trip I did by myself, full trip was to Costa Rica in 2009. And it was fine. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I think at first I was like, what do I do by myself? Like I went and sat in a park and was like <laughs> people watching. And, and then like I joined like some group activities or whatever. Um, but to me, I, I just want people to interrogate their fear. And, you know, you said, especially as a woman, people always say that. And I'm like, no, damn the patriarchy. Like, <laughs> we don't have to be afraid as women to travel yeah. solo. Like, you know, I think a lot of the fear is around maybe sexual assault and things like that. But most women all over the world are sexually assaulted by people they know. That's like yeah. a fact, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's like maybe when you're traveling, you're actually a little bit safer, you know. Yeah. Um, I think as women, we have intuition. And we have to listen to that. So, you know, if you're like with someone and you're like, mm, energy feels off. Yeah. Like go the other way. You know what I mean? And then, yeah. of course, there's fail safe. Like I if I'm traveling alone, I prefer to stay in a hotel because I like to have 24 hours like concierge and things and just people at the desk. Um, I think hostels are great if you're traveling alone because you get to meet other people. Um, but the world just isn't as scary as they want us to believe it is. Yeah. I think if if women everywhere were empowered to feel safe everywhere they went, it, we'd be living in a much different world. But I feel like by continuing to stoke the flames and say, oh, as a woman, you, yeah. you have to be careful and so scary. And as a black woman, it's even scarier. And it's no, it's not. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely been to countries where they're like, oh, I'm like, ah, oh, 
it's I was like sometimes I'm like are you sure because I feel like the U.S. can be pretty scary <laughs> oh no like people are always <laughs> like you know where have you been the most afraid I'm like I'm black in America I am the most afraid here <laughs> like when I think about the worst things that like one of the worst things that ever happened to me I was on vacation in Miami mm. and a cop pulled a gun on me point blank range oh, like wow. that has never happened or even come close to happening anywhere else in yeah. the world number one because police don't carry guns in a lot of countries um, and number two, because it's just not happening. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of Americans, it's it's like the devil you know. Mm. And so a lot of people, especially who haven't spent a lot of time outside of the country, don't realize how violent and scary the United States is. Oh, yeah. I remember they were saying how, like, now for anyone, any tourism that comes in from other countries, they're like, there's a warning about yeah. shootings now. And I'm like, yo, that's crazy yeah, that yeah. they have to even warn tourists yeah. who come to our country. Because it's scary. Like, I, I try to explain to people the thing here is, because people will bring up other countries, but here it's indiscriminate violence. Mm. You can be in a mosque, like a temple, a church, yeah. a nail salon, a grocery store, anywhere. And that to me, that's what makes it scary. It's not that it's gang violence and it's relegated to a specific place. It's like, nah, anybody can get it anywhere at any time. Yeah. Which is scary. Yeah, I remember I went traveling. My friend and I, for work, we had to go to Japan and like the countryside. And there was this one place that we wanted to visit, but the concierge at our hotel was like, oh, if you go there, you may not be able to get a hotel because no one speaks English there. And I was like, eh, we'll figure it out. But like, that was honestly the most exciting and, and fun experience because I felt like I was really able to experience their culture and their community because it wasn't, it wasn't a situation where they were forced to speak English. Like I was actually trying to speak Japanese to them because I, I like to immerse myself in, in different cultures. And you know, when whenever you went to different countries and you try to immerse yourself in those specific communities, like what kind of value did you receive from that experience? Yeah, I think I learned more about the culture. You know, I think for me, it's like I try not to have expectations and go in and mm -hmm. just be open minded. Um, and I ask a lot of questions. I'm like a five year old. And because even though I know a lot about the world based on my educational background and my work background, I never go in places trying to confirm what I think I know. I go in like pure curiosity, you know, and just asking a million questions. And by doing that, I learned so much more because at the end of the day, the people there know more about their country than Google ever will, right? Because I feel like before people travel, they Google way too much, in my opinion. <laughs> um, and it's like, just get there, you know, get your flight, get your hotel, but then just get there and just like let life happen. I always like to ask them, like, what's the best place to eat? Like, where's the best place to eat? I, I'm a massive foodie, so I love asking locals, like, so, about the food. That's what I always do, too. Like, I'll be, it's so funny. So I was in India. So I'm Ugandan, and if you know the history of East Africa, the mm -hmm. British took the Indians there um, to build the railroads. So growing up, I ate a lot of Indian food because my mother makes it. Oh. Um, and so going to India, I was like, oh, my God. I've been wanting to go to India my whole life just to eat. And it's so funny because I remember telling my guy, like, I want to go where you eat. And he's like, OK, I'm like, I don't want any tourists. I want to go where you eat. So he takes me to this place, me and my friend. We had come from um, the Taj Mahal. I'm okay. so excited. We pull up to this place and there's three buses full of white people. And I was like, mm, I feel like this is not where you actually eat. Come to find <laughs> out when the guides take people there, they eat for free. Uh, so they take all the tourists okay. there. It was literally the worst Indian food I've ever had in my life. Oh, no. I was pissed. But then when we got to Udaipur, I tried the same thing. This shopkeeper, I was like, where can we go get good food? He sent us to this place. They didn't speak English. I was like, perfect. <laughs> um, now, I didn't drink the water there, but the food was amazing. Like, it was, we went back three times. It was oh, so wow. good. And, yeah, literally no one in there was speaking English. We were just, like, pointing at pictures. Uh, it that, was amazing. That is, like, the best place to go. That's what happened with me when I travel. I'm just, I'm, like, I'm pointing like this. Yeah, this. yeah, yeah. But I, I love how technology and just more individuals like yourself are, are showing the beauty that comes with traveling. Mm -hmm. Um, it's funny because like when when I look at someone like you or even like I love following like travel photographers too because it's just it shows you that there's so much beauty in this world. Do you feel like, you know, through your experience and just highlighting it, do you feel like it's so important to show people 
the adventures and, and the importance of traveling. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, I think it's really important how we tell stories of places that are not our own. Mm. You know, I think it requires a delicacy um, and a dignity that we've not seen in the past. And that's why, um, so last year I published a book with National Geographic and Congrats. thank you. <laughs> um, and you know, National Geographic is the canon for travel, right? Like when we think of travel, it's like Nat Geo. And they've gotten it wrong a lot in the past, right? In particular, um, images coming out of the African continent. And so even getting to work with them, I was so intentional in terms of the countries. So I did 100 of the 195 countries, but there's over 300 images. And for me, I was so intentional about the images that I was sharing because I knew this will become a part of the travel canon, right? Mm -hmm. And so showing beautiful images from Yemen or beautiful images from Sudan, South Sudan, Afghanistan, places that people think beauty doesn't exist, it was really important for me um, to do that in ways that I have not seen before. And, you know, the difference is who's holding the camera. And I always say, like, if you look for misery, you're going to find it. But if you're looking for beauty, you're going to find it. So the way I may take an image versus somebody else, it can be the same person, but it could, that person could look completely different. So, yeah. And, and what was that process when you're trying to select the picture? Because, it's, you know, it's not even, you know, it, part of it is showing the beauty, but then you also have to be very mindful of what's being depicted because there are some countries that have certain attire, or certain things in the background that may have religious components of it or things like that. So like, what was that process to determine, like, okay, this is the right picture? Yeah, I mean, um, it was a give and take. <laughs> when you do a book, you do not have creative control all the time. Um, but it was just, thinking about how I would feel. So I remember there was this book. It was a Lonely Planet book I bought years ago. I was so excited because it was like a book from um, about every country in the world. Mm -hmm. And I get the book and I'm like, Uganda, let me find it. And there was this picture of a little boy in the market and he was like really dirty. And I'm just like, that is the single image of Uganda that you're including. I'm like, forget about Lake Victoria, the source of the Nile River, our culture, our food, mm -hmm. gorilla trekking. We have all of the big five. None of that made it, but this little dirty boy in a market made it. And so for me, that was constantly in my mind. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking if I were from this country, would I feel good about this singular image? Or, you know, in some cases there were multiple images. Would I feel good about these images representing my country? And that's really how I looked at it. So mm -hmm. I, and I fought, <laughs> I fought with my, with the editorial team <laughs> sometimes um, because there were pictures that I didn't think were perfect for, um, for the entry. And, and so it was a, a little you know, push and pull, but <laughs> what came out in the end, I was super happy with. Well, uh, I'm glad you're able to push and pull for that. Cause like you said, the imagery and what's being represented is so important. And I think that because there's certain images that people see often, it may discourage them to travel and to go to those specific countries because of what they perceive the country to be. Exactly. And it, it's it's unfortunate. I feel like it happens to so many different places. So like, for example, my family's from Puerto Rico and right now the biggest thing is like how Web3 and people are going down there for taxes and, and, and you know, the other imagery is the big flooding that happened instead of like the, you know, the rich community, the, very beautiful country land and all mm -hmm. these different things and yeah. it's just like uh, the only time you see puerto rico in the news is for devastation yeah and not for the beauty mm -hmm. of, of everything and yeah. you know have through this work that you've been doing have you had conversations with any other media platforms uh, about the way that they perceive other places because i feel like you have such a unique position because you can speak to your experience of pretty much every country mm -hmm. And I feel like that's part of, the, part, part of the problem here in the U.S. is how the U.S. perceives every other country based off of uh, the patriotism. 
that we yeah, have. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I've had conversations with a lot of editors and chiefs, and um, in particular in the travel space, mm-hmm. there's a handful, so y'all can guess those titles. Um, and, you know, because my, my issue is, like, the exclusion of a lot of African countries, right, mm-hmm. or brown and black countries globally, that exclusion leads readers to assume those places are either not safe or not worth visiting, right? That just the exclusion of it. You don't have to say anything, but by excluding it, this is what's happening. And I've had those conversations and they are not very interested in radical change. You know what I mean? Like there's still a very Eurocentric focus in the travel space and that's what it is. And you know, for me, it's like I can't continue to bang my head against the wall um, in hopes that other like these publications will change. But, you know, I write articles from time to time. If I'm writing articles, it's typically only about the African continent. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's because that's important to me, like people going to visit African cities is important. Like safaris are dope. I love safaris. I just came back from safari. The beaches are phenomenal. But like someone goes to Paris or London, why not go to Accra or Dakar or Nairobi or Kampala or Johannesburg? So for me, I'm very much like go visit African cities in the same way you visit European cities. Do not go for volunteerism. Do not go looking for orphanages. Just go and visit it as you would any other city. Yeah, there's other pictures people can absolutely take yes. of the beauties uh, instead of uh, orphan kids. Yes. Yeah. Stop. We, we Stop it. That. Stop taking pictures with orphans, everybody. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do it. We got to change that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Clearly, you're very passionate because, uh, you know, your background, your family's heritage. Mm-hmm. When were you able to turn that passion of not only just showcasing what Africa as a continent brings and, and the value and the beauty that's in it, but when did you turn your passion into travel to an actual career? Because I feel like that's a dream come true for many people. Yeah, everybody. Yeah, everybody says that. Like, oh my God, you're living my dream life. Um, here I am, like two days back from a three and a half week trip, seven countries, over thirty thousand miles, and I'm like exhausted. I'm like, maybe I'm getting a little sick. Um, but you know, very grateful. Mm-hmm. And I think optics are confusing <laughs> because people are always like, oh my God, teach me how to pay, get paid to travel, and I'm like. But I don't really get paid to travel. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, okay, just now I was on, I, I had a bunch of different things, but like I was on assignment for a magazine. So mm-hmm. I was in Botswana and Mozambique. I was speaking at a conference in the Maldives, which mm-hmm. sounds crazy, but like I was in the Maldives for work. Um, and so there, there's different things that I am I do. Yes, it like it requires me to travel, but it's not necessarily getting paid to travel. Um, but really I would say... First things first, I started my blog in 2009 before Instagram even existed. Like I had a blog and I did it because I was living. I started my first blog in when I moved to Japan in 2008 and then I changed it over to the Catch Me If You Can, which still exists today. Um, And it was because I just was traveling and I wanted my friends and family to see what I was doing. Probably the first time I like got a penny for like anything related to travel was maybe 2018. Oh, that's a recent. really yeah, yeah, and that's a really long time. Yeah. So I think the key is passion, mm-hmm. right? Because if you do something and you go into it like, how am I going to make money from this? It's going to be hard to sustain and be consistent if you're not making money. Like, mm. I'm really like about this life. You know what I mean? <laughs> I well, yeah, <laughs> you went to every country. I would hope right. so. <laughs> and like, I spend my own money to go visit places that I want to see. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because I want to travel and go to those places. So I would just encourage people, like, don't try to copy and paste, because you can't. You're only seeing a highlight reel, so you never will know what the full life looks like. But to me, I'm like, find your passion. 
everyone doesn't actually want to visit every country in the world. Like it is exhausting. It's expensive. Um, you'll often be like, what am I doing? Why? Uh, but I really encourage people to really just like look inside of themselves and figure out their passion. Like that was my dream and my goal. And yes, a lot has come on the backs of it. But I also think like the resilience that it required for me to do that mm -hmm. is something that a lot of people don't possess. You know, being held in immigration, People thinking I was a drug mule leaving Pakistan, wow. like American immigration thinking my U.S. passport was fake. Like I've just dealt with so many things like nothing violent has happened against yeah. me, but I've dealt with like a lot of things that required me to just like deep yoga breaths and <laughs> all right, go into the country and still have an amazing time because that's what I want to do. Um, so, yeah, I would just encourage people to really focus on making sure you're passionate about something. So when you're not getting paid, mm. you're still doing it. What were you, th for those who are like, okay, out there listening to this, I want to do it, right? What do you think would be like three countries that, you think could be like a good start for them to check out? Like, cause you said, don't go to Paris, don't go to the typical European countries. What would be three countries that you would advise for them to go and check out? Hmm. Um, oh, that's a good question. Egypt. Ooh. I think Egypt is easy, right? Like they've been doing tourism for a long time. Um, it's relatively inexpensive. The pyramids are magic. Um, so Egypt. Um, Kenya, Ooh. Kenya is good. I think Kenya and Tanzania have the best safaris in the world. Nairobi is a really cool city. And then you have the beach as well. Mombasa, Lamu. And this is so hard. I hate <laughs> having to like make short lists. Um, oh God, Brazil, Brazil. I want to say Brazil. Brazil. Okay. I think Brazil. Brazil is amazing. Um, I've been to Brazil. I don't even know how many times. Now I go every year at this point. But Bahia uh, is an amazing region in Brazil. Rio is dope. Um, so, yeah, Brazil. I want to name 28 more, but I'm going to let it go there. <laughs> okay. I'm going to stop. <laughs> no, those are, those are great. Yeah, Brazil's on my list. Uh, it's like a couple years ago when they had, I think it was like the World Cup was there. Mm -hmm. I was trying to go down there. Uh, I'm just, yeah, I just got to go and do it. I, you know what the problem is? I always try to find a reason to go because I'm like, oh, I have to work. Oh, if I can get a work trip or do something. I'm like, I just got to go. Just go. Just go. I mean, Brazil is worth it. I, I had a work trip to Brazil <laughs> in February, but I, um, I built out a week mm -hmm. before so that I could just hang out for a week. Uh, before I had to go work, but yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll just go. Just go. I'll just. I'm just gonna. It's go. worth it. Like Brazil is worth it. Yeah, just like the thing I love about it too is like. So for me, I I kind of like for for you when it comes to like yeah, just Africa and how that's so important for people to understand that for me it's it's absolutely like Latin and Hispanic cultures because. My family, we have so, like, my family is very mixed. We have all kinds of different backgrounds. And there's such a misconception, especially when it comes to Latin America, because it goes back to what you were saying about how it's perceived in the media and how the content uh, content and show. Like, now, like, all people talk about when, when it comes to certain countries is, like, the cartel. Like, yeah, the cartel is a thing, but there's other beautiful things about these different yeah, countries. for sure. And that's why, for me, like, I want to, like, I want to go to Peru, um, I've been to all the islands. Uh, Colombia, I do want to go to. Colombia is one of my favorite countries. Really? Oh, so I've my been friend's family's like there. five or six times. Yeah. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Love yeah, it. I'm going to try and go because my friend, her family's there. So I'm going to try and go with her mm -hmm. there. Um, Cuba? But, yes. Oh, Phenomenal. Love Phenomenal. I've been five times. That's another place that there's great mass misconception around because so of the much. history behind it. Yeah, yeah. Just go. <laughs> just go like here. don't worry about what they say about the <laughs> rules and right just go you can just go to cuba you don't need to file any paperwork just, i went and came back and it's i've been five times just get that flight yeah just, just get the flight literally just buy the flight and go you know that's I, it i think i'm gonna do that after this i was gonna pick a flight i was gonna go somewhere and be like <laughs> we're going here it's so this traveling in and this whole experience have opened up so many doors for you probably so what has it opened up for you? 
Yeah. Um, I mean, beyond writing a book for National Geographic, um, just, you know, the opportunity to meet so many interesting people, but also using my platform for storytelling with brands. Um, so I work with the Four Seasons a lot, mm -hmm. uh, which has been incredible just because of the feedback I get from my audience, you know. Unfortunately, in a lot of travel marketing, brown and black people are not being spoken to. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, obviously social media has democratized the industry in that way. Mm -hmm. And I get feedback from people who have the money to spend at Four Seasons, but often said they didn't feel welcomed. Mm -hmm. So now that they see me there, they're like, oh, okay, just because there, I could feel good going. And and I get so many messages from people who are like, oh my God, I went to this Four Seasons, had an amazing time, thank you. Um, and I love that, because I just want to see more people that look like me in these spaces, because I, I love luxury. I'm a tourist, like very into luxury. Um, and a lot of times I don't see people that look like me at these in these spaces, and I'm trying to change that. And it's not that people don't have the money. Yeah. People absolutely have the money, but they they need to feel like they will be welcomed. Was that one of the, the inspirations behind your new book, Catch Me If You Can? You know, what inspired you to write it? Was that one of the vehicles behind the inspiration or is there many different inspirations that drove you to write? Um, well, Nat Gia reached out and asked me to write it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's inspiration too. <laughs> that was first things first. But no, my my editor, Allison Johnson, is phenomenal. Lisa Thomas, the head of Nat Geo Books, is phenomenal because a lot of the other publishers I spoke to had something in mind, like, mm -hmm. okay, write a guidebook, a how-to, tell black people how to travel, tell women how to travel. And I was like, yeah, that doesn't really speak to my soul. Mm -hmm. um, but what did speak to me was sharing my personal experiences and really using my storytelling to reduce bias. So my favorite thing that can happen is someone DMs me or emails me and says, I never would have considered visiting this country if I hadn't read your book. Like mm -hmm. that is something that really warms my heart because they've gotten what I wanted them to get out of it. They've they've seen another side of these um, countries that they've not gotten from any other media, whether traditional media, Instagram, you know, whatever social media. Uh, so my book is doing that. So that was really it. And and you know, one thing I hadn't accounted for was children interacting with the book. Oh, okay. And that has been really beautiful. And not just black children. I think it's amazing that like black children will see this book and they can see themselves in it. But I have a friend who I used to work with. Um, she's white. And she sent me this video of her five-year-old daughter going through the book. Like, Aww. okay, what's this? Can we go to this country? And it was just, you know, I've gotten images of kids all over the world reading the book. And I'm like, what? Like, I just, I didn't. I don't have kids, so I just, <laughs> I didn't think about that. And now Detroit Public Schools is using, is going to be using the, the book as their textbook for the sixth grade, which wow. I'm like, what? So to have, you know, a generation of kids that are going to grow up, number one, knowing it's possible to visit every country in the world, but also being able to just see, because some of the images in the book are of me, mm -hmm. um, but just to see, like, images of a black woman a dark-skinned black woman you know gallivanting around the world it's 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 life-changing for a lot of people yes and i mean not only for them but life-changing for you yeah, overall for sure. you have a for book sure. you've tr literally traveled the whole <laughs> world so i gotta ask you what is next huh that's a good question i'm like you know this is a summer of figuring out what is next um you know money doesn't motivate me and that that's been true for me my entire life um you know i only want to do things that have real impact mm -hmm. and and again like my big thing is using my storytelling to reduce bias and change just how people see the world um, but yeah, I don't know, maybe a podcast, maybe a TV show, who, who knows what's going to oh. happen. If you do, I mean, <laughs> Hey, do it. If you do a travel show that you're the perfect person yeah. because you went everywhere. Yeah. And I mean, right now, actually, um, I'm hosting a docu-series, a travel docu-series okay. with WhatsApp, which has been incredible. And basically we're looking at diasporic communities and cities around the world. Mm. So, um, so far we've released, uh, the Nigerian community in London. 
just now we did the um, Japanese community in Brazil, which oh, was wow. super fascinating. Uh, we also filmed the Indian community in London, the Turkish community in Berlin, and the Ugandan community in Boston. Oh, wow. So it's just really been so amazing. It's called Crossing Cultures, and it's been so great just to go to these places and see how, um, like, for example, in Brazil, how the Japanese immigrants and their children and their children's children have been able to maintain their Japanese culture, but also infuse it with Brazilian culture. And so what you have in Sao Paulo is the largest community of Japanese people outside of Japan, which is incredible. Yeah, like I, I'm so into all of that stuff because like, for example, that's how I learned about how ingrained um, Japanese citizens were to Peru. Mm. And because someone I know is Peruvian and they actually have um, family members who actually look more Japanese than they do Peruvian. And mm. I was like, oh, really? And then they explained that. And then also like even like um, there's another uh, diaspora in um, the south. There's a massive, I believe, a Chinese community. I think it's in Mississippi, mm -hmm. but they talk about how the integrated Chinese culture with the Southern culture and how it's mixed now. Yeah. And it's just so fascinating. Yeah. And I mean, you know, we live in such a globalized world. So I think so many questions around identity come up. Like, how do you feel? I mean, even for me, I'm like, yes, I'm American, but I'm very much Ugandan, but I feel more like just generally African. Like it's so it, it's, it, I, there's some really beautiful conversations that happen in the series just around like how we identify. I'm at a point now where I'm like, I'm just Aaron. I don't know. <laughs> like, you know right, I'm just right, me. right. Yeah. Cause it's, you know, because even when we talk about the identity, right? Like, for example, um, whenever I tell people uh, I'm an Afro Latina, whenever I talk about the Puerto Rican side, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican and black. And they're like, no, aren't you both? But I'm like, no, no, the Puerto Rican side is actually Native American side. Mm. Because I think there's this conception, especially when it comes to island, that it's like, oh, the blacks are already mixed in. I'm like, no, there actually are some people who are just strictly Native American there. Mm. And, and they're not. And But, you know, it's it's I'm sure it's challenging sometimes. Because I, I, I'll admit, I sometimes get frustrated because it's like, why am I educating? Like, there's so much information out there. Yeah. But then on top of it, it's like, it's important for me to educate so that people understand the differences. Like, I still have to talk to people and educate them on the difference between Spanish, Latino, and Hispanic. And how they could be same, but they're not the same sometimes. And, it, like, even that dynamic is, like, yeah. the basic level. Right. But people still mix all of them together. Like, they'll call, like, Brazilians Hispanic. I'm like, no, 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 they're not Hispanic. You know? Oh my God. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a struggle, but yeah. it's so important that people understand. I mean, I think... Just give them a quick thesis statement and point them to the right place. On I send them a URL now. You know, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, because here's a video. <laughs> the thing is, at the end of the day, while information is there, people don't know what to look for. That's you true. know what I mean? And I think, unfortunately, in this country, people don't care about the nuance, right? Like, people are always like, are you Nigerian? I'm like, just ask me where I'm from. Do not ask me if I'm Nigerian. You know, like, just don't do that. Just say, where are you from? Because it's like you're assuming that all Africans are Nigerians. Now, granted, it's a whole lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> and they're the loudest. But, like, you know what I mean? That's that's one place to start. Like, don't assume where someone is from. Just ask. You know? Yes. Just ask. It's so, Well, also... Be mindful of how you ask. <laughs> Don't Be ask what are you. <laughs> uh, not what are you. Oh, my God. So often I'll say, where is your family from? Yes. I'll ask, like, what is your family's heritage and yeah. background? Yeah. I usually say that. Yeah. Because yeah. then if someone, like, looks, is black or Asian or whatever, then people be like, well, I'm American. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, because <laughs> people ask me that, and I'm very aware of what my face looks like. Yeah. So I know they're like, they're not asking me, am I from Detroit? They're asking me, like, where's your family from? So, you know. Baby steps. Baby, baby steps, steps. For sure. For everyone who's tuning in that would love to keep up to date with everything that you have going on, where can they find you on social media and online? You can find me at Jessica Nabongo on Instagram. And probably some other places. <laughs> and then my website is thecatchmeifyoucan.com. Is that where they can find your book too? 
Yes, the catch me if you can dot com slash book. Awesome. <laughs> Make sure you all check it out. Jessica, thank you so much for yeah. joining us on Real Gems. Thank and you. for everyone who's tuning in, don't be afraid to travel. Don't yeah. be scared. You you have someone here who's been to every country. <laughs> Listen to her. Drop in the comment section. What country would you love to travel to and go to? Not I would say tomorrow. If you can, book your flight. Make sure you like, subscribe, and also follow us on all platforms for Real Gems. And also stay tuned for the next episode. We have more amazing guests to come. Until then, my name is Erin Ashley Simon, and we'll see you all later.